We welcome you this morning for our um, divine service. And as an opening hymn, we will uh, sing uh, hymn number 563. 563, let every lamp be burning. Before we kneel down, we will read the text for this morning, and is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. With this word in our mind, we'll go on our knees for the opening prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, this Sabbath morning we are coming in the present, Lord, to thank Thee for Thy mercy. We thank Thee for Thy love and for Thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, that through Him we may have everlasting life. Father, this morning we are asking, pleading with You this morning that You may be merciful upon us, that You may bless us with the Sabbath blessing, that You may give us Thy Spirit this morning, that You may understand the Word, that we, Thy Word that we will uh, listen, that we may put it in our hearts, that we may put in our minds, that we can live according to thy will. And when you come again in the clouds of heaven, Father, that we may be found ready. We are asking for thy mercy, for thy love, and we are asking for uh, forgiveness of our sins that we have done. Please forgive us and be merciful upon us. And when you come again, that we may be found ready. Be with those who are struggling in their lives, be with those who are in the valley of decision, be with all of us. Then when, we, when you come again, we may be found ready. Father, this is our desire, this is our wish this morning, that we may be found ready in uh, this day of thy coming. Father, we are thanking you for all the goodness you're showing upon us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, I would like to greet you all, and uh, I 
before we go further, I have a few announcements that I would like to share with you this morning. Um, first of all, there will be a fellowship lunch uh, after the divine service. The prayer meeting is uh, every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, Brother Walter will uh, have uh, children Bible, for, Bible study for children right after the, uh, the lunch, so um, be prepared for this. Um, Canvassy project, uh, as you have noticed, we have uh, for the last few months, we have this announcement in our um, bulletin. So we are preparing for the uh, bigger event, for a bigger uh, Canvassy project in Toronto. So um, uh, we anticipate some uh, needs, financial needs. So we are all um, asked if we can somehow help with, with these needs. Uh, they're also uh, reminding, uh, the reminder for us for the kitchen duties, for kitchen, uh, for all those people who were um, working in the kitchen to postpone the work until um, the divine service is done and also for preparation of food to be done as much as possible earlier than uh, today. So um, they're also a reminder or uh, some announcement for the spring maintenance. Uh, if the weather is permitting us, we'll, uh, April 22nd, we will have the spring uh, cleaning around the grounds of the church. So we are urging all of uh, members, all of those who are willing to help to, uh, to join us. Um, also for the members of the board meeting, the reminder for the April 29th. So these are the um, announcements for today, and now I will call upon the deacons to collect the uh, divine service offering. We thank you for your offering. May the Lord bless the gift and the givers. The kids have a song. We'll be now listening to the kids. They have a song for us this morning.
Thank you, children. Thank you very much for the song. You, we enjoy every Sabbath your singing. Um, we'll skip the second hymn, and uh, we'll go right to the uh, sermon. So, Brother Walter, have a sermon for us today under the title, We Have the More Sure Word of Prophecy. So, Brother Walter. We are happy to be here together. I'm always happy. I've been here for so many times in this church, at this place, and I always fear, feel that godly fear when I come here. Um, there is a special awareness that, that you're in God's presence in a special way when you preach the Word of God. And as I age and as I mature in my spiritual walk, I realize more and more how important it is to break the word of life. We had in the Sabbath school today about the sower and the seed. And, and when you are in this place, you are sowing the seed in a special way. So how we sow, it's important, but it's also important how is the soil, what kind of soil is on which, what kind of soil is the seed falling? So I ask you to be a good soil this morning as we hear the Word of God. I'm happy to welcome here those who do, are not with us every Sabbath, like Sattlemeyer family, our dear friends and brethren. And um, I just met a moment ago a brother here who apparently is from Brazil, uh, David. Uh, so... He, we are very happy to have him, and we have other brethren who are from Brazil. They can communicate later on after the service. <clears throat> Tanya reminded me, reminded me in the course of this week that uh, this is the first Sabbath in the month and that I should have something suited for the young people and children. So I promise I will do so. Uh, and I will try to make the sermon. It will be about prophecies. I will try to make it simple, but you know how Albert Einstein said that we should difficult and complex, complex things make as simple as possible, but not more than that. If you go too far, you distort the truth. So you can simplify, but up to a certain level. So I hope you will understand that. Now, before I go into the topic for today, <clears throat> I'd like to make a very little word of clarification. With the Bible students that I meet with throughout the week, uh, we had the opportunity to a little bit review my sermon on the last Sabbath. And uh, I, if, for those who have been here, they know I have spoken about the sacred times in the Bible and in the church history. And uh, last weekend was the Easter holiday, so I also touched on the Easter and um, some of you have spoken with me, and you understood me. I'm very glad about that. That we Christians do not, uh, we seven Adventists, we do not keep Easter. But this does not mean that we do not value highly the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We simply do not keep that particular time as a sacred time because it was not established by God in the Bible. Now, God has established sacred times in the Old Testament, and there were several of them. Three of them or four were in the springtime and three in the fall. Sowing season and harvesting season, right? So, we had Passover, waving of the sheaf. We had the unleavened bread, seven days. We had a Pentecost, 50th day, spring festivals. Pointing to certain saving acts in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And they were fulfilled. Jesus died on the Passover. He resurrected when the priest was waving the sheaf on the third day. And then 50 days after, there was a Pentecost. Everything fulfilled. And then the fall festivals. 
But we mention that these festivals with the death and the resurrection of Jesus, they've met their fulfillment that they came to the end. They are not more applicable in the Christian dispensation. We don't keep these feasts. We read from the spirit of prophecy, to keep Passover today would be to deny that Jesus died already for us. We have the communion service. We don't have Passover today. We do not have Easter. Now the Christian church wanted to have Christian calendar with the feast days and holidays without biblical mandate. So they were establishing holidays, remembering certain saving events from the life of Jesus. So they established Easter, and there was a problem when to celebrate Easter on the 14th of Nisan, when the Jewish people were celebrating Easter, or on other days. Anyway, it's a long history. But brethren, we have no authority to establish holy days without God specifically telling us. We could, for example, say, why don't we celebrate the day when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration? We can celebrate the day when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Right? We can establish all kind of, and in the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodox Church, you are having all these feasts. But this is not mandated by God. We know that we have one sacred day that has remained, has never been changed, and this is the seventh day Sabbath, which is still valid, which should be kept. But other sacred times that the Jews had in the Old Testament, they came to the end with Jesus Christ. The whole system was swept away because it met, type met antitype, Shadow met the reality. Apostle Paul said, let no one judge you in food or drinks or in the new moon or the feast days or the Sabbath days, annual Sabbaths, because they were, for all of them, were shadow of things to come. But the reality, the bodies of Jesus Christ. So no one should judge us today if we don't keep these holidays today. And no one should judge us if we don't keep Easter or Christmas today because they have no biblical foundation. Yes, Jesus was born, and we are glad and joyful because of his birth. Yes, Jesus suffered, died, and resurrected, and we highly uphold these truths. But we do not assign any specific time of the year because God has not done so. Now, Markham reminded me that I have to elaborate more on Colossians 2, and I will do it, God willing, next time. Explaining the meaning of these words, let no one judge you. Because some people apply this to the seven-day Sabbath and say, now the seven-day Sabbath has come to the end. But this is not what the Bible says. Seven-day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, is not part of ceremonial system, of annual Sabbath. It's a special day. This is what we should be clear to us. But I will talk about that later on. Now, let me tell you what I will be talking today. Um, a few weeks ago, I was asked by one brother who was scheduled to teach at our missionary school in Ukraine if I could substitute him. And he had some other unforeseen event he has to attend. And I said, OK, I'll do it. And um, so somehow the conference allowed me to do that. And uh, I will be from uh, April 16 to April 26 in, in Ukraine in our missionary school, teaching biblical apologetic, uh, uh, apocalyptic prophecies, particularly prophecy, uh, book of Daniel. Now I was preparing a little bit for these lectures, and I mentioned in the Sabbath school I was immensely blessed by going through the prophecies, apocalyptic prophecies of the Bible and the book of Daniel in especially. Now, young people, children, I would like that we here in our conference have um, little seminars so that we talk more about this. In this uh, sermon today, I will just touch on some of these fundamental things. 
which make us Seventh-day Adventists distinct in the Christian world today. And every one of you, brethren, here sitting, every Seventh-day Adventist should know these basics. These are the pillars of our faith. We studied today in the Sabbath school about different soils, and we spoke about the stony ground, and the stony ground is a very shell, uh, shallow uh, layer of soil, and the seed falls inside and springs up, but then when the sun comes and, you know, heat, it dries up and dies. Now, if you do not have deep roots in the present truth, how we call it, you will be swept away. I will be swept away. We will lose our foundations if we don't build, if we don't know who we are, what we believe. Brethren, I was so reassured, so reaffirmed in my belief in what we believe and who we are. Throughout the week, I was speaking to my family and saying, look, Why we are not more enthusiastic about this message? Why we are so lethargic sometimes and, and carried, you know, uh, absorbed with the cares of this world? Why we don't proclaim this truth more fully? Brethren, our foundations are very firm. And we should reaffirm and we should teach our young people and children and everyone why Seventh-day Adventists exist in this world today. What is our mission today? What are we for here? I'd like to briefly review with you, especially from this end-time perspective. Seventh-day Adventism is the end-time movement. We came, our name, our everything is focused on the end-time, preparing the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have to understand, we call it apocalyptic movement or apocalyptic prophecies. The word is Greek word. Apocalypsis means revelation. Now, these are prophecies related to the end time. Now, there is a difference between classical prophecy and apocalyptic prophecy. Very briefly. Classical prophecy is prophets, prophet Isaiah, prophet Jeremiah, prophet Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea. And so on. What is the difference between these prophet, prophets and prophecies and prophecy of Daniel and prophecy of Revelation, which we call apocalyptic prophecy? I'll give you a few characteristics. In classical prophecy, prophet is primarily dealing with local things and contemporary things or not so distant future. If some classical prophet would go occasionally to the distant future and the end of time, he would not cover the ground in between systematically, progressively. He would talk about the present time, near future, and then maybe jump to the end time, the day of the Lord, but not cover the whole ground in between. We call it telescopic. You just look here and go to the end. Apocalyptic prophecy covers the ground from the time of the prophet Daniel or Revelation to the end of time, successively, every stage, no gaps. We call it historicism, historic, historical school of prophecy. Or historicism means successively covering the ground. Now, this is different from futurist and preterist school of the prophecy. And I will explain to you in a moment what it means. Seventh-day Adventists are historicists. We believe that Apollo, uh, uh, apocalyptic prophecies cover the time from the time of Apost uh, from the prophet to the end time continually. No gaps. Now, you heard about dispensationalists. Seventy weeks from Daniel. Seventy weeks. And they have a starting year in 457 or whatsoever, like we, B.C. And then they come to the time of Jesus, and then they separate the last week, 70th week, and put it to the very end of time. Make a gap. And then they say in this last week, which is seven years, 
you know, they will, the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, and the Antichrist will be there, and, you know, there will be persecution, tribulation, and so on. This is, you know, dispensationalists, futurists. Some other Christians, which are mostly liberal Christians, if you go to any Protestant today, Roman Catholic theological school, more liberal, they will teach in preterism. Preterism means most of the apocalyptic prophecies from Daniel and Revelation were fulfilled latest with the Antiochus Epiphanes, second century BC. So there is no prophecy going beyond that to the end time. Now what these did, and this is a special story, this did that the Roman Catholicism, a papacy, was exempted. You either end with Antiochus Epiphanes and you don't go further, or you just jump and go to the end, end of time. So you don't cover this period of Christian apostasy. So in that way, they escaped. And you cannot identify an Antichrist as a apostate Christianity. Okay. Now, I'd like to highlight here that we are historicists and premillennialist. What does it mean, premillennialism? Millennium means a thousand years. So we believe that Jesus comes before pre-thousand years, premillennialism, before thousand years. Second thing that is very important that we also inherited from other Protestants is conditionalism and anti and annihilationism. I'll explain briefly. We believe that there is no conditionalism, conditional immortality of soul. Soul is not immortal. We are mortal. We are only conditionally mortal. If we obey God, when we inherit eternal life, then we will be mortal. But we are not immortal unconditionally. Second thing is, the wicked will be annihilated. There is no uh, eternal suffering in the hell of the wicked people. We do not believe in that. We believe in annihilationism, which means that wicked will be ultimately, they will suffer, but they will be ultimately destroyed. This is the second thing that we believe. And the third thing uh, that, is, uh, that we inherited is restorationism. We believe with some other Protestants that certain things that were um, misinterpreted and distorted throughout dark ages will, will be restored before the second coming of Christ. We believe in this restoration. Now let me just briefly move forward to give you a little bit overview. When seven Adventists or early Adventists started in the 19th century, what was the condition of the world, Protestant world in North America? Most Protestants at that time were post-millennialism post-millennialists. They believe that the world will be progressing, improving, and the kingdom of God will be established on earth before the second coming of Jesus. So there will be a thousand years of prosperity and peace on earth, and then Jesus would come. These are post-millennialists. So if you read William Miller and his associates, they were fighting this view that the conditions in the world will be gradually improving, and then there will be a thousand years of peace and prosperity, and then Jesus would come. This is what Adventists attacked and debunked. Postmillennialism. So we are premillennialists. We believe Jesus will come before the second coming, and there will be tribulation before he comes. Now, uh, today... Many Protestants are premillennialists, but they have now a problem. They believe Jesus will come before 1,000 years, but they are also uh, believing in so-called pre-tribulation. So what they believe in secret rapture. So they believe that before tribulation comes, the church will be raptured secretly, taken to heaven, and there will be tribulation. This is, again, wrong. So Satan is always finding the way how to... to, to 
Now, another important thing for Adventists is a principle of a year for a, or day for a year principle, year day principle of interpretation. So when you come to prophetic times in the Bible, in the book of Revelation and Daniel, we take that the day stands for a year. It's a very important principle. Very important principle for historicism. And we also believe that papacy is the little horn from Daniel 7, 24 to 26, and from Daniel 8, 19 to 14. So we, are not, we were not alone. Historically, Protestants, reformers, believe the little horn is papacy. And they identified that the papacy, the bishop of Rome, rose to power in the 6th century AD. You know, then you know the years 508 and 538. I don't have enough time to give you all the evidence. I will go in detail through the school, in the school with the students with that. But just remember Clovis, a Frankish king in the Western Europe, promoted Bishop of Rome. And then Justinian as well. The emperor sent a letter that he declared that the Bishop of Rome is the head of all the churches. So you see, these are very important historic events where we can see how the Bishop of Rome and papacy came to power. So we have these prophetic periods of 1260 days or years, starting in 538 and ending in 1798. 15th of, no of February, 1798, what happened? Napoleon's general Berthier came to Vatican, to, to Rome, and took Pope Pius VI a prisoner and took him to France, where he died in exile. Now, in the 19th century, Protestant reformer, I mean, uh, interpreters also discovered that the, the, the prophecy about 2,300 days will be ending about 1840s. Both in North America and in Europe, they came to that conclusion. But the most prominent Bible interpreter who dealt with 2,300 days was in North America. What is his name? Villa Miller. And he developed the most precisely elaborated and refined chronological calculations of biblical prophecies and pointing to the soon coming of Jesus Christ about 1843. Miller applied day for a year principle. He was premillennialist. He was historicist. And he harmonized different time periods. He came to 1843. Now, Samuel Snow was another Adventist who, told, who was looking at the, the Jewish calendar, and he said uh, the, the sanctuary will be cleansed. So this means this is a day of atonement. So they were looking at the year 1844. When is the Jewish calendar day of atonement? And they came to the October 22nd, 1844. You know what happened. There was a great disappointment. Jesus did not come. And... Uh, so there was uh, <clears throat> this uh, discouragement. But please remember, a Millerite movement was focused on the second coming of Christ. This was the central message, second coming of Christ. Millerites were coming from different Protestant denominations. And they did not encourage, they actually discouraged, uh, members of the movement to dwell on other doctrines. Uh, they wrote, brethren, let us not uh, now argue about the other points of faith and doctrines. Let us just focus on prophecy and the second coming of Christ. But some Millerites were also teaching. One of them was George Storrs. He was teaching and publishing that people are not, do not have natural immortality. He was writing against immortality of soul. George Storrs, even in 1840s. Now, please remember something else. When disappointment came in 1844, in October of 1844, the movement disintegrated, Millerite movement disintegrated, splintered. Majority of early Adventists returned to the churches, former churches to which they belonged. Some returned to the mainline Protestant churches. 
But the small group continued. Now, what is important to understand in that group that continued, there were two groups, major groups. One group believed that 18, that 2,300 days is wrongly calculated, miscalculated, and that Jesus would come at the end of 2,300 years or days, but that they put it too early. It should be reset, resetting the date. And they were trying to reset. Other group, they were called the open door Adventists. The other group were shut door Adventists. And shut door Adventists believed that calculation was correct, that 1844 was important here, but that something happened. Jesus did not come to the earth, but Jesus moved in heaven, in the heavenly sanctuary, from one part of the sanctuary to another. These are the shut door Adventists. And from this shut door Adventist, and they were actually, for them, was important prophecy from Matthew 25 about 10 virgins and the bridegroom. Bridegroom was coming in the middle of the night, and the door was shut. Those who were ready, they walked in, and the door was closed. So they believed that this represents Jesus moving from the holy to the most holy, and the door was shut. You know, in Revelation, he has the key of David, and he closes the door, and no one can open, and when he opens, no one can close. Sister White had a vision, and she saw Jesus close the door of the holy place, open the door of the most holy. No one can now open the door of the holy. It's closed, and the most holy door is open. So these were shut door. Jesus closed the door of the holy place, entered the most holy. These were our pioneers. And they also connected this with Daniel 7, 13, and 14. You know, that someone like the Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. There was a judgment throne. The books were open, angels around. This is what they believe. This was fulfilled in 1844. Jesus came to the Father in the most holy place to execute judgment and to do the cleansing. This is the Day of Atonement. Now, I'd like to share with you six distinctives. Now, when we came to this platform, to this stage, what distinguishes seven Adventists from all other Christians? Important truths. What is the cluster of truth that makes us distinctive? So please remember, we are historicists. We are premillennialists. Please remember, historicism means apocalyptic prophecies. And let me just mention this again. Classical prophecy, apocalyptic prophecy. In classical prophecy, prophet may prophesy against a nation or an individual, but that prophecy will not be absolutely fulfilled. It depends on the reaction of the people to whom the prophecy is given. For example, it's a negative prophecy, judgment prophecy. If people repent... If individual repents, the prophecy may not be fulfilled. Yeah, case of Jonah. I was just reading last week about Jerusalem and Judah when they were provoking the Lord. And uh, God pronounced a judgment. And Nebuchadnezzar came in 605, took the captives to Babylon, and, and, and Daniel and his companions were also taken to Babylon. Some people stayed in Judah and Jerusalem. Jeremiah stayed with these people who stayed. So at the same time, Jeremiah was a prophet in Jerusalem. Daniel was a prophet in Babylon. Now, what happens? Very interesting. Nebuchadnezzar appoints a ruler, a governor in Judah, among these remnant who stayed in Palestine, and na names Gedaliah. Gadaliah, as a ruler. And people of Judah come to him and to prophet Jeremiah and say, please ask the Lord, what shall we do that God would have mercy on us and that he would restore us and that he would not judge us? 
Would you ask God? Now, Jeremiah says, no problem. I will ask God and let you know. After a few days, Jeremiah speaks to God. And God gives a message through prophet Jeremiah to the people. You can read it in the book, Second Chronicles. And in, in the book of Jeremiah, actually. Chapter 30, 31. And God says, if you really will keep my covenant, if you will do my will and my commandments, I will restore you, build you up. You will not be moved. I will prosper you. Even at that late hour, God was still prepared. You know, brethren, this is amazing. It's amazing about God. God may pronounce a judgment against you, against the nation. If the nation repents, if individual repents, God will not execute the judgment. Amazing thing about God. I have not found in the Bible one single case where someone genuinely repented and that God did not accept that individual. If you found such a place, let me know. Even the wicked king Manasseh, who was one of the worst in Israel, who was doing his children sacrificing, putting through the fire, he repented and God was merciful to him. I'm amazed how wonderful. So classical prophecies, God can pronounce a judgment, but it's, it is not a must. It may happen, but may not. Now with apocalyptic prophecy, please remember that. With apocalyptic prophecy, God shows what will be. Absolutely. There is not if. Absolutely will happen. So Daniel, a revelation, what is written there will absolutely happen. This is the difference between classical and apocalyptic prophecy. Second thing, in classical prophecy, symbol or event or a person may have, the prophecy may have double application on more than one event. In apocalyptic prophecy, a symbol or event has only single application. You heard about Dr. Desmond Ford, who attacked Seven Adventist eschatology and our system of belief in the 1980s, 70s and 80s. And many people who have left Seven Adventism, they make mistake in this cardinal point of the prophetic interpretation. They make multiple application of apocalyptic prophecy. Apocalyptic prophecies have single specific application. You cannot have double or reapply it. One single, historically, no, it doesn't repeat. Now, when we teach students in missionary school, they have to understand very well these principles. They are very important. If you make mistake there, you go wrong direction. And today, in Adventism, there were some people who were trying to go in futurism, taking 1,290 days, 1,335 days, <coughs> trying to find application in the future in tribulation time. This was finished in 1798 and 1844, last prophetic period. No time prophecies. Don't listen to that. Somebody tells you time prophecy after 1844, cut it off. No application. <coughs> so, I don't have much time. Let me quickly go through these six points. Now, one important thing that seven Adventists did with respect to 2,300 days, you see, William Miller connected the end of 2,300 days with the second coming of Christ. And this was a problem, coming to earth. Seven Adventists understood that end of 2,300 days is not second coming of Christ to earth, but Jesus entering in the most holy place. So Seventh-day Adventists have divided, separated, end of 2,300 days in the second coming of Christ. That's very important. End of 2,300 days, 1844, second coming of Christ are two separate events. You understand? Two separate events. Not the same. So we do not set times. We do not know exactly the day and hour, but we believe that 2,300 days and 1844 are important times. 
second important component of Sabbatarian Adventism is millennium. We believe that thousand years on millennium, the saints will be in heaven with Jesus Christ, not on earth. Many Christians believe thousand years will be on earth. No, in heaven. Thousand years, Jesus reigns in heaven with the saints, and the saints exec uh, do the judgment of the wicked. Even William Miller, he was a premillennialist, but he believed the thousand years will be Christ's reign on earth. Seven Adventists, no. We believe thousand years are in heaven. And James White, in 1844, 1845, began to teach, first, the saints would go to heaven at Christ's second coming, according to John 14, 1, 3. Let not your heart be troubled. There are many mentions in my father's house. I will come again and take you. So this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Second, James White said they would remain in heaven during the millennium while the earth would remain desolate. Jeremiah in 4, 19 and onwards. So desolation, Revelation 20. Satan as that dragon is chained, limited to this desolate earth for a thousand years. And three, the saints would return with Christ to this earth at the end of the millennium when the earth would be renewed in order to receive Christ's everlasting kingdom. Second Peter says that, don't you know that this earth will be burned with fire? Before it was flooded, second time it will be burned with fire and God will make new earth. And after a thousand years, saints and the holy city descend to this earth. This is biblical teachings about millennium. We have specific and clear biblical teachings. Third, major component of Sabbatarian Adventism, as I mentioned, is conditional immortality of soul, or we call it conditionalism, and final annihilation of the wicked. No eternal suffering in the hell. Many sincere people were turned off from Christianity because of these unbiblical teachings that God is like a monster torturing people forever, you know, throughout eternity. There will be suffering, but it will be time limited. And people will, you know, Malachi says what? You remember that, what Malachi says? You will look for the wicked and he is not, he will be burned. Ashes, right? Ashes means destroyed. Both root and branch, everything destroyed. And we believe that the dead are waiting unconsciously in their graves. In Psalms and Ecclesiastes, we know that dead know anything. And this gives a special meaning to pre-advent or investigative judgment and the resurrection. So if people are alive, like souls somewhere, so in, what investigative judgment has to do? If people, when they die, immediately go to God's presence or to purgatory or to hell, so you don't have a need for pre investigative judgment because they're already judged, right? So you see, the belief in immortality of soul, that souls right away go immediately after death to a certain place, means that there is no judgment. You already determine where you go. But we do not believe they are sleeping, judgment is in progress, and then they will be, you know, after the resurrection, they will receive reward. Not before. Fourth important point is the two-phase priestly ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. So this is what we mentioned already. In 1844, Christ finished first phase in the holy place, entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is what we believe, to do the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is the final stage of the work in sanctuary. And so there is a, now what is also important to understand is that there are two resurrections. And James White developed this uh, concept. He said, there must be judgment or judicial determination before you have resurrection. So both righteous people who will be resurrected, they have to be judged. 
and the wicked who will be resurrected after a thousand years, they have to be judged. Now tell me, when are people judged? When are the righteous judged? From 1844 until the close of probation. And they will be resurrected in the first resurrection, the righteous one. When will be the wicked judged? Thousand years in heaven, the saints will judge the wicked. And so when they will be resurrected after thousand years, they will be already judged. So see, when people resurrect, they receive the reward or punishment. So judgment must take place before. For the saints from 1844, onward before first coming I mean second coming of Christ and for the wicked during thousand years so and the fifth point we also believe that there will be an end time polarization of humanity between those who would be loyal to God keep his law moral law ten commandments and seven day sabbath and those who will be disobedient who will embrace the counterfeit human religion keeping Sunday. This is Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, right? And went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So seven Adventists have understood that this great conflict has to take place before the second coming of Christ, there will be two polarization, two groups, only two groups. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and testimony of Jesus Christ and those who keep the Sunday, who have the mark of the beast. They understood the seventh day Sabbath is divine institution of creation and Sunday is a papal counterfeit. Little horn, Daniel 7.25, the mark of the beast, and the seal of God are two different things. Mark of the beast is Sunday, keeping when it will be enforced by law. And the seal of God is the keeping of the Sabbath and signifies God's special sign in relationship with his people. You will keep the Sabbath, God says, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, makes you holy. These are God's people in the end time. And the last point I'd like to mention is connected with the previous one. I mentioned that among the Protestants in the United States in the 19th century, there was so-called restorationist movement. There were Protestants who were believing as we are approaching the end of the world, the divine institutions have to be restored before Jesus comes. And we seven Adventists firmly believe that all divine institutions will be restored. Uh, Camille, we spoke this week about this. And we mentioned how during the Dark Ages, there was a lot of error, a lot of superstition, a lot of, uh, you know, heresy. And then, gradually, reformers were removing these layers of superstition. You know, even some Roman Catholic priests, for example, uh, day for a year prophecy, There were Roman Catholic priests who were doing the research in 12th century when Innocent III was the Pope, one of the most uh, <laughs> formidable popes. He was teaching that. Another Roman Catholic cardinal in the 15th century was also establishing some principles of prophetic interpretation that we, you know, God was having different people. Martin Luther was a, uh, was a Roman Catholic monk. God used these people. John Wycliffe. So you see, these people were coming and just restoring one truth by another, by another, right? Righteousness by faith and so on. But this work, progressive work, didn't stop with Luther. We have later on John Wesley, founder of Methodism, who was teaching more about holiness than Baptists came, teaching baptism by immersion. And other things we have in common that are very close to us. And then God raises Adventism. First, Millerite movement, and then later, seven Adventists. And now we are in the process of restoring all these truths before the second coming of Christ. But the sixth point tells us also as we are doing this work of restoration, 
there will be a conflict. And they identified another beast. In the Revelation 13, we have two beasts. One is the sea beast with seven heads and ten horns. A composite beast. You know that beast, right? Which is papacy. But then you are having a two-horned two beast rising out of the land, earth. And this is who? The United States of America. Very interestingly, seven Adventists recognized, identified that power, and they said that power will work in unity with the first beast. And they will cause great and small and poor and rich and everyone to worship the first beast to make and to worship the image of the beast and to receive the mark of the beast. This is Revelation 13, 11 to 18. So, now, brethren, with respect to this last point, I don't want to talk about this today, but <coughs> I believe that we seven Adventists should speak more without getting into politics. We should be focusing more on these two-horned beasts today and recognize what's happening with the United States today. You know, I read one uh, study by a seven Adventist sociologist and historian who wrote, who wrote I, like, I agree with him, that we seven Adventists have an ambivalent attitude towards the United States of America. We have a love I wouldn't say love-hate, but love and great concern relationship with America. On one hand, our roots are in North American soil and the United States as a nation especially blessed by God. But we know the transition will happen in the history and the United States will change from a peaceful, freedom-loving country with great constitution, with great human rights and liberties it will change, become a persecuting power. And this is happening before our eyes right now. This is happening both in domestic law and in international law. United States are behaving like a bully. I'm sorry to say that. There are world policemen that are pushing everyone, you know, in place. We are, we are going for a one world government. We call it globalism and information technology and uh, you know, communications will enable them to have a worldwide control. This is coming. I'm reading article after article by very well-informed people who are not Adventists, who are saying people in the United States are sleeping citizens, don't realizing what's going on. Their liberties are taken away. And once the house of cards will just fold. Wow. And you know, Catholics and Protestants, so-called Protestants, are today in union. Protestantism, except for Seventh-day Adventists, no other Protestant, major Protestant denomination, upholds historicist view of prophecies. No one identifies papacy as antichrist except us. We are the only ones holding the ground today. Not that we take pride in this, but we should be thankful, God, that we have this view. And then, brethren, these foundations were laid from 1844 to 1862 when Seventh-day Adventist system of belief was more or less formed, apocalyptic view. We have unique view of the end time events. And then we discovered, we put it together with three angels' messages. Three angels' messages are giving us mission, why we exist, what is our purpose. And then also the great controversy, cosmic controversy motive from Revelation 12, you know, when you have that woman clothed in sun and the dragon attacking the woman. And you are having progression, apocalyptic. Attacking first, war started in heaven, transferred to earth, wanted to kill the child, the dragon. The child escaped. 
But then he persecutes the woman, which is the church, through church. Church is running in the wilderness, having a place for hiding 1260 years. And then he is waging the war with a remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And this is God's people today. Brethren, when you study this, you cannot, unless you are blind to identify the seventh Adventism is the truth, is the movement of God today. No other church in the world stands for this what we stand for. I feel an urge that we should declare this more clearly and proclaim this message to other, other people, especially Protestants and even Catholics and other Christians. Not boastfully, not putting down other people, but I mean, uh, because three angels' messages is a message of love. Apocalyptic prophecies, and when God prophesies doom, God wants to save people. God doesn't want that wicked should perish. He wants to save people. And I believe that we, from young to old, we all have to understand these prophetic foundations of seven the Adventist message. We have to have roots. We have to know who we are and what we are for. What is our mission in the world today? I'd like to continue, and I promise by God's grace we will have studies where we will, for both young and older and whatever, offer evidence and proof for every point of belief. We have to be able to give reasons for our belief, why we believe so. As I was going through these prophecies, through the book of Daniel, I must tell you, I was amazed how sure is our foundation. Brethren, we will look at this world today with different eyes. When you see these kingdoms come and pass, and when you see the storm gathering today, we need the shelter today. And that shelter is Jesus Christ. He is the one who holds the stars in his hand. He is the one whom Daniel saw as the Son of Man. He is the Prince, Messiah the Prince. In Daniel 9, Jesus Christ, Daniel saw him in chapter 10, when the Persian kings, when God wanted to restore uh, Judah back to the promised land, uh, to, the, to their country and to captives, to ex exiles to return, there were enemies in the Persian kingdom who were trying to prevent issuance of a decree to restore Jewish people there. For three weeks... An angel who spoke to Daniel said, I was fighting for three weeks with these forces of evil. Right now, brethren, if our eyes could be opened, for God and his angels are withholding back four winds of strife. You know, the four angels standing in the four corners, holding back that the wind should not blow until the saints are sealed in their forehead. Right now, if our eyes could be seen, we, we would see this spiritual battle. God is holding back these winds. I don't want to go into contemporary politics. Even today, God is acting mercifully to give us more time to prepare. May we prepare. May we be sealed. May we proclaim this glorious message. May we one day be on the sea of glass. We have a privilege to be among 144,000. May God grant us this desire and help us to be there. Amen. Thank you, Brother Walter, for that uh, beautiful uh, reminder for uh, most of us uh, and importance for that uh, great event that is ahead of us. So in closing, we will uh, all rise up and sing hymn number 576. 576, Watch Ye Saints. Please arise.
after this beautiful song, we'll go on our knees for a closing prayer. Gracious and loving Father in heaven, we are in your holy presence, in the presence of the King of the universe, surrounded by millions and millions of holy angels and holy beings. You are in your holy temple, Lord, and all the earth and universe tremble before you. But we thank you, Father, that you have revealed yourself to us as a loving God, long-suffering and merciful, but who will in no wise release or vindicate the guilty. Father, we thank you for this wonderful hour of worship and contemplation of the Holy Word. We thank you for thy unerring word that you have given to us by the word of the prophets. And we thank you, Father, for these great prophets, great men like Daniel or John, who have written for our instruction these beautiful words that we may have a hope by the Scripture. Father, we thank you that you have revealed to us these great mysteries of the kingdom. Thousands and millions and billions are in darkness, Lord, and we are enlightened. We have a great privilege. Oh, Father, help us that we may appreciate. May you touch our hearts. May our hearts be the good soil that thy word may fall and spring up and bring good fruit. Father, we thank you for these prophecies of the book of Daniel Revelation. We thank you for the great Advent movement, for the great reformers, for faithful men and women who have given even their lives for the truth. May we have their spirit. May we stand in these last days of earth's history on this platform, eternal platform of truth. May we proclaim this beautiful message, three angels' messages that people can be warned and saved in thy kingdom. O oh Lord, help us. Help us to realize how short is the time. Help us realize, Lord, that the forces of evil are bent on destroying thy people. But your hand is still raised. There is still time of probation. Help us, Lord, to make sure that we are in peace with you and with each other. Bless us, Lord, individually and collectively, and help us to realize importance of preparation for their soon coming, because the probation will close one day, and there will be no more pardon. Father, help us to stand on this platform of the great truth you have entrusted to the Seventh Adventist movement. May we by faith follow our Savior in the most holy place, and may we be cleansed from all pollution and every sin. And may we be sealed by the seal of the living God. We pray for our youth, for our children. We pray for our dear visitors. May you, Lord, help them understand these truths. And may you help them to take the stand for you, for eternal truth, for Jesus Christ. Forgive us our sins and shortcomings. Be with those who are sick among us, who are discouraged. And help us, Lord, that we may march forward and onward in the great battle you have given to us. We know that the battle will be victorious for those who defend thy commandments and the faith of Jesus. May we be among them, Lord, and may we one day be on the sea of glass. We ask all this and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.